Two lectures ago, I talked briefly about critical theory and mentioned that one of the most important strands of critical theory is feminism. In the late 20th and early 21st centuries, many women challenged male domination of art and what they saw as a male gaze that dominated and distorted artistic depictions of women and especially their bodies. This artist used to be a college board favorite. She's gone now. Maybe she's too old school. But her art captures this notion of a male gaze. And this video clip is a little old too, but it will introduce you to some of what we'll be discussing today. You'll see this work and several earlier Cindy Sherman self-portraits of herself rendered in various female stereotypes. Okay, back to this image. The artist overlaid a photograph of the head of a classically beautiful female sculpture with cut and pasted text that challenges the male gaze. Appropriates is a term you need to know. It means borrows from other sources, so you'll often hear the term applied today to borrowing from other cultures. Picasso appropriated African art in Demoiselle d'Avignon. Kruger started her career at Mademoiselle magazine, and in part she's satirizing the slick packaged image of women that magazines present. Although I have to note that these magazines are mostly produced and read by women themselves. So what do you think this work means? Here's what the College Board says. And by the way, a lot of this analysis could be applied to Cindy Sherman's Untitled 228 or Wangechi Mutu's Prey Mantra, which is why I'm talking about an old work. Feminist art historical explorations of the male gaze examine the asymmetrical power relationship between men and women in society. So I'm going to pause for translation into Russian. That basically means that the men are the katos and women are the kavos. In particular, uh, feminist art historians examine the way women are viewed. Women are passive and thus robbed of agency. That is, more translation from me, the ability to, make, to act and make decisions for themselves. Remember, the kato is the subject of a sentence. It's the who. Kavo is the object. It's the whom or the to whom. To continue with the College Board, in Kruger's work, which is technically a photograph, the profile of the woman passively invites the gaze, yet the words actively deflect or return that gaze, making the response pretty personal. Do you remember this painting from an earlier unit? It was actually commissioned by Queen of England. It was basically asking for a photograph of a gallery before it was possible to take a photograph of a gallery. But the work, I think, perfectly captures the male gaze, and it has showed up on the AP test in the past. Back in the same unit, we also contrasted the classic subject of a male gaze, Titian's Venus, with a 19th century courtesan who most decidedly gazes back. So what do you think feminist art critics would say about Monet's work? Is this just another, maybe more blatant example of the male gaze? It's almost certainly a male who's about to walk in that door. Uh, or is this, in fact, a feminist painting? She sure does gaze back. I think my answer would probably be all of the above. In her so-called film stills, they aren't actually taken from real movies, Cindy Sherman poses herself in various stereotype female roles, like Barbara Kruger. She challenges the male gaze, but she does it by confronting the viewer with her own preconceptions. Remind you of any other artists we've recently seen. Bet y'all got that one. And what about Faith Ringgold? In this work, not a required work, she pretty clearly challenges that Aunt Jemima stereotype. Her Aunt Jemima is a successful businesswoman. But what about these works from the French collection? Not our required work, but from the same group. Willa, Willa, William Marie Simone, our heroine, makes it big in Paris, but she does it how? By submitting herself to the male gaze. Now, Paris in the 1920s welcomed African American artists and musicians, especially jazz musicians. But I wonder if they weren't viewed a little bit like Picasso's African masks exotic? Powerful, beautiful, maybe a little dangerous, distinctively the other. Something to be gazed upon, maybe even something to be possessed. Anyway, back to Cindy Sherman and our next required work. Here are some more photographic images, some of which you also saw in the video. All of these, I think, make the point that Cindy Sherman sees women as constantly performing, living out roles expected of them by others. 
Now here's where you have an advantage, thanks to the first week of the course. You all remember the story of Judith and Holofernes, right? Let me repeat a point I made back at the beginning of the course when you were probably filing it in your mental circular file. Don't have to worry about May and August. At any rate, the Judith images we looked at, Gentileschi's, Caravaggio's, Goya's, Klimt's, the Gucci's, all of them would be excellent works to choose for an essay. Your readers would enjoy a break from the same old, same old, and since you know the narrative, you'd have something to say. I recommend going back and looking at these works and making sure you know the identifiers, uh, even though they're not on the list. The history portrait series, like the untitled film clips, is both homage and satire, in this case directed not to old movies, but toward famous old paintings. So, what do you think? Which Judith version might Cindy Sherman be channeling here? Well, I don't think there's a single painting that she's imitating in some of the history portraits she is, uh, or at least I couldn't find a specific reference to one, but the Khan Academy reading mentions a similarity to Botticelli's women. So what similarities do you see and what differences? Well, the clothing is similar, although Botticelli's heroine seems to be wearing sandals on much smaller feet. The faces, likewise, are similarly demure, which I find rather odd given our heroine's bold and gruesome act. I actually don't think this is one of Botticelli's best paintings. Uh, Cindy Sherman's expression is a little scarier, maybe even a trifle unhinged. So what other differences do you notice? Well, Botticelli's Judith is a dainty young Italian aristocrat. Remember Florence's sentimental attachment to Judith and David. Cindy Sherman's Judith is enormous. She looks like she just came out of a costume store and did not max out her credit card in the process. Khan Academy uses the adjectives tacky, chintzy, and cheap for her clothes and makeup, and that seems fair enough to me. So what do you think of a Halloween mask, Cola Fairies? What point do you think the artist is making here? I'm going to flash a few more of her photographs juxtaposed, ah, our word again, with paintings that she may or may not have been imitating. This one pretty clearly is an imitation. It's Cindy as Bacchus next to Caravaggio's version, the sick Bacchus, which is also thought to be a self-portrait. So you have side-by-side -side self portraits. And that's Cindy Sherman on the left and Raphael's La Fornarina on the right. The woman in the painting, the Raphael painting that is, was probably Raphael's lover, Margarita Ludi. Art historians aren't entirely certain. At any rate, she's clearly meant to convey idealized human female beauty. So how does Cindy Sherman play with this? For, to answer that, you have to look carefully at the photo. And if you do, you'll see she has strapped on fake plastic breasts and a fake stomach. If you look up at the shoulders, you can see the joints clearly exposed. So what points do you think she might be making about the female body, about artificial enhancements, and about the relationship between art and photography? Uh, I'm not going to try to answer those questions, by the way, but I think the Judith photograph raises many of the same issues. If you have time, here's a very short video clip of Cindy Sherman trying to explain why she photographs herself in all these roles. So. What are three things you want to remember about this work? Up until now, we've been talking mostly about gaze, the male gaze, the photographer's gaze, but now we're turning to female artists who are more interested in exploring the body, and in the case of our first two artists, the female body in relationship to nature. Kiki Smith trained as an EMT as well as an artist, and her early work shows her fascination with human anatomy. Many of her works also focus on body fluids. Breast milk is shown here. Also urine, menstrual blood, uh, waters from pregnancy. She often seeks to expose and break down social taboos, especially those that hide the workings of the female body. In the mid-1990s, her artistic interest turned toward nature, and she discovered that drawing and etching was a great way to capture the delicate nature of feathers and fur. She also became more interested in the iconography and symbolism attached to animals and the role of animals in fairy tales and religious narratives. So you all recognize this particular fairy tale, right? Lying with Wolf also has its origins in a narrative, sort of. I've put the artist's own description of her inspiration up on the slides. So you may want to take a moment to read that. 
So St. Genevieve was a young girl who lived in France in the last days of the Roman Empire. Uh, her prayers as a teenage nun were credited with turning Attila the Hun away from Paris, and she remains the city's patron saint. So I tried without success to find the work that Kiki Smith refers to. I was looking at the Louvre website. And as far as I can tell, the main association between St. Genevieve and wolves is that the saint protected her sheep by keeping the wolves of Attila from the door. You might also draw the comparison with St. Francis and his relationship with animals. I didn't really find that for St. Genevieve. My guess is Kiki Smith likes to use female saints. At any rate... Uh, the story clearly resonated with the artist. So why do you think? Well, it's a story of female power. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's a story of the power being used to bring peace. I think part of the message that she has here is that women are uniquely qualified and uniquely able to end such masculine pursuits as warfare. Uh, by the way, I didn't put this in, but it's an interesting comparison with Sharon Nishat, who seems to be kind of celebrating that women have partly found their political voice by joining in an armed struggle. At any rate, Kiki Smith was raised a Catholic, and she continues to be very interested in both Catholic and Buddhist thought, although apparently she is no longer an active Catholic. But clearly, her Catholic upbringing has influenced Kiki Smith's art. If you have time, I think it would be interesting to stop and talk about this quote and to talk about how it might relate to other works we've studied in this course. I do realize time's getting short. So in a moment, you'll go through the usual drill and come up with three things you want to remember about this work. But first, I'd like to stop, like you to stop and share your own personal reactions. What do you think of this work and why? Okay, now I'm going to explain why I asked and really to make a confession. I personally find this work irritating. I realize that the artist is making a sincere point about living in peace with nature and about female spiritual power, but I just find I have this snarky reaction that the drawing insults wolves and maybe women too. Wolves are beautiful, deadly, fierce, loyal, but they are not cuddly. I'm all about women acting with power and confidence, but if one of my daughters decided she wanted to snuggle up with a wolf, I would probably schedule an appointment with a competent therapist. Okay, I vented. On to your three things to remember. This artist is also exploring female power, but she puts her female figure into a very different relationship with nature. Why do I say that? Remember this image from the first week? This time I managed to find a citation. Praying mantis females devour their mates after sex. But the insect imagery goes beyond ferocious female power. The word mantis derives from the Greek word for prophet or diviner. We actually spell the insect's name with an A, a reference to its common position, which some people think resembles prayer. Mantra is a religious chant. So is this not an insect? So is this woman looking for dinner? Or is she looking for the meaning of life? Uh, so Wangei Chimudu is a female artist from Kenya. She now lives and works in New York. Her works are often described as cyborgs. So, if there are any science fiction fans out there, what is a cyborg? Okay, I'm going to cheat a little and read from a scholarly paper on her work. I'm sorry if that seems like a cop-out, but I'm going to admit freely that I find this piece very puzzling. Intriguing, but puzzling. So, here we go. Somebody else's thoughts. Wangechi Mudo's collages on paper and mylar, McConnell interruption, that's polyester film, the stuff balloons and bouquets are made of. These collages often present female figures composed of human, animal, object, and machine parts. Let me just interject. That's what a cyborg means. Among the sources of her mismatched fragments and decorative patterns are pornographic, fashion, travel, and automotive magazines. Again, the popular culture, another thing we've seen a lot in this unit, is using popular culture artifacts, if you will, to send a message. Uh, oops, now I have to find where I was. Um, in addition to colorful coffee table books on African art produced by and for Western audiences. Another McConnell interjection, note the colorful pattern cloth the female figure is sitting on. And note that a number of our third world artists are very preoccupied with the question of how the Western world looks upon, world looks upon, exploits, uh, distorts images of the rest of the world. 
to continue. Mudu fuses an assortment of body parts and extremities with hand-drawn and painted elements. It's often the female body in an endless variety of new formations that she chooses to construct. In so doing, she provides a transcultural critique of the female persona as dramatized and represented in Western culture. By the way, I think very interesting comparisons could be made between this and Demoiselle d'Avignon, which of course is a Western artist using African images to make certain points about the female. So to recap, this work engages with gender roles and with ethnic and cultural stereotypes. Mudu is especially interested in the way black female bodies have been stereotyped and exploited, which again suggests a uh, fruitful comparison with Kara Walker. But this female, I would say, is equipped to fight back. Not sure I'd want to mess with the horned woman on the right either. So here's a quote from the author. The work on the right uh, is entitled Cancer of the Uterus, and it is actually a pathology diagram overlaid with glitter and a woman's eyes and lips. So again, we see these found objects, the artifacts from, I mean, I wouldn't call it pathology diagram precisely popular culture, but from the real world, if you will, repurposed into art, shades of the fountain. So how do these works combine the desired and the despised? Okay, here's another intriguing quote quote, and further collages that demonstrate this combination of female power, female vulnerability, and gender and cultural stereotyping. I think it would be worth stopping to talk about it. But you'll find this fun. The artist actually made a film starring one of her cyborg creatures. So I want you to watch part of a video in which she discusses the work and shows us a little of what looks like a weird and kind of fun movie. Okay, you know the drill by now. What are three things you want to remember? And I'm going to stop here. Our next artist, Magdalena Abakanowicz, is also a female artist and also explores the human body. But as the title Androgen III suggests, her bodies are conspicuously neither male nor female. They are merely, if incompletely, human. So stay tuned.